I was 33 years old, well over 400 pounds, and food was my prison. And then I learned that food had the answer to my questions, and my kitchen had the cure for my disease. When I was 400 plus pounds, and I, I don't have an exact number because I, I had actually blown past the scales that all had that, that weight limit. Life was all about the food. I was deeply struggling with a processed food addiction. There was this little voice inside me that said, if you don't do something, you will not make it to 40 years old. And that's when I really just fell in love with the idea of how can I be my best self? So I was fighting for me and fighting for my health. When I went plant-based, my whole relationship with food changed. I realized how much better I was feeling. I feel like I'm firing on all cylinders. That's magic to me. And the weight just sort of slowly melted away, which is something I never thought was possible. Now, food prepping for me is a joy. I celebrate the quality of the food. It's just very rewarding. Healing starts at home. Mine did. And so can yours. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marbus, and today I'm very excited to welcome another vegan fitness enthusiast, Gabriel Shane. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you, Lori, for having me on. Thank you. And I hope I didn't slaughter the last name. I've been saying it. You did. Head. You did no, great. You did All great. right. Yeah. Let's keep it up. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so you're from Vegan Fitness Redefined. So you've got quite a bit of I mean, good stuff on there and you guys check it out. But we're going to talk all about your journey and health and how that relates to, you know, bodybuilding and strength and just overall mm. fitness and see what you think. But um, tell us a little bit about your story. What led you to a whole food plant based diet? I'd be curious to to know your your what led you down that path. Mm, yes, yeah, great question, by the way. And I think you know the seeds were initially planted about like uh, five or six years ago when I first became pescatarian. Mm. And I you know just being completely honest, I actually never knew what the word vegan meant. <laughs> I knew what vegetarian was, and I was like what's vegan? Like I started hearing like this word like vegan. I'm like, what are they? <laughs> like, I don't even know what they are. Right. But I, I knew what vegetarian was. Um, but I started, I, I was actually living in uh, Yonkers, New York at the time. So back in New York mm. and there was like a Zen center. I would go and meditate every Sunday. And sometimes after the meditation, they would have uh, like a meal. And I'm like, Oh hell yeah. I'm staying for a meal. I'm like, I was just meditating all morning. I'm staying for a meal. And they started to bring out like plant-based meals, like whole food plant-based meals. And I was so curious. I'm like, you know, where's the protein, right? Because, you know, obviously I was still pescatarian. I was like, you know, working out in the gym and trying to build muscle. And I was like, you know, what, what, what is this? You know, I'm like, there's no protein at all. I'm like, no, nothing, like no dairy, no eggs, nothing. And I was like, I was really intrigued. And, you know, they basically explained like, this is vegan, you know, but they also explained like the reason why, right? They explained like, you know, this is, this is like food, but it's compassionate, right? And I was like, oh my goodness, you know? Here I was like, kind of like just thinking about like compassion as like this idea, right? Mm. And here they were actually putting it into action. So compassion in action. And uh, later that year, actually, I moved to uh, Bristol, United Kingdom. Uh, my wife had been, or my wife now, she'd been vegan already five or six years. And she had also been educating and telling me more about uh, veganism in general. And so I became vegan that year. And while I was vegan, you could say like in name, I feel like I truly became vegan in, in spirit about a year later when I started to connect more deeply with the ethics and the morality, even the spiritual aspect of it as well. Um, and in terms of whole foods, like com being completely honest, I truly feel like I didn't go like whole food plant based, you know, like more like really focusing on having like foods from the planet, fruits, vegetables, like herbs and spices. I didn't focus on that until like two or three years after right because mm -hmm. my first initial thing was like oh like you're vegan like that's health right and you know there's so many misconceptions especially as you're learning about veganism and all the foods and i think it's amazing they have so many options now but i think that it's easy to get misdirected there's a lot of misinformation disinformation out there and i think it's very 
useful, right? To have uh, to have your base, your foundation, you know, really coming from food that supports your health, right? Doesn't mean you can't build muscle, you can't drop fat, you can't be lean, strong, and toned. But at the same time, there is no fitness, there's no six pack, there's no oh, I'm so strong. If there's no health, you know, there's mm-hmm. there's over 250 million Americans just in this country alone who have chronic symptoms, chronic conditions, right? Myself included, I grew up when I was 10. I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. They told me, you have psoriasis, right? Oh, wow. You have this for the rest of your life. Being a 10-year-old, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. They're like, your body's fighting you. Your body doesn't like you. I'm like, what? Like, you're a 10-year-old, you'll believe it, right? And yet, the more I've learned these past 5, 10, 15 years, the more I've learned that actually with food, with nutrition, you can heal anything. Mm-hmm. You can heal anything, no matter what people tell you out there. Mm-hmm. So tell us... Um... Then you transitioned to the psoriasis. Did you have ongoing issues and it went away at the plant-based diet or did it kind of, what was that journey like? Ooh, I mean, this is, this is actually all being completely honest. This is still an ongoing journey. It's still an mm. ongoing journey for me, but the transition into whole food plant-based has been, has been spectacular. It's mm-hmm. been absolutely spectacular because even when I became, became vegan, there yeah. wasn't such a kind of like shift in like some of the symptoms and things like I saw. But the moment I started focusing on just two things, on just adding more fruits and vegetables, that was it. I, as a vegan, I eat plenty of fruits and veggies. Like, come on, that's all we eat, according to everyone else. Mm -hmm. But there was a difference between just having one apple a day, maybe a banana here and there, and amping it up to having Mm -hmm. two or three apples a day, three or four bananas a day. All of a sudden, it was like symptoms that I had for years, decades, right? Things that I've been suppressing with steroids, hydrocortisone, all of a sudden, Mm -hmm. it's like, holy crap, all I had to do was have more apples and bananas. Mm. This is nuts. And yet it's that information. That's why I say it's disinformation. Mm-hmm. This kind of information is not, it's not, nobody talks about it, right? And the people that talk about it, they're like, oh, they're crazy, right? Mm-hmm. Or they're talking about fruits and veg, whole foods. Like, what is this? This is nuts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, your body's capability of healing itself is, is quite profound. And, um, and it can, you can be very seriously ill and have significant improvements. And sometimes not 100%, but certainly uh, improvement to the point that they would have never thought they could have reached that state of health. You know, it really depends on where you're entering into looking into whole food plant-based diet, especially if you can get these young people like yourself, that's really ideal. Like my kids, you know, in their twenties and, um, they're all plant-based one's a physician. Um, but yeah. And then, you know, you think about the future for them is going to be one free of chronic disease. Um, Mm. you know, hopefully in, yeah, it's exciting to see uh, the new generation coming up behind people like myself and <laughs> moving, the, moving the needle even further. So excellent. So tell us a little bit about your kind of fitness journey and what led you and your wife to start the Vegan Fitness uh, Redefined. Sure. Yeah. So I actually, I grew up as an athlete since I was five and, mm-hmm. you know, I, I played all the American sports, you know, like soccer, baseball, tennis, swimming, martial arts, all that. And in my early 20s, actually, I was uh, trying to play semi-pro soccer. Um, mm. And it was just like my passion. Like, you know, I lived, I breathed uh, soccer. I grew up like my father, he played um, uh, professional uh, soccer for the Ecuadorian national team. So it was like, it was my blood, awesome. right? Yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, so after that kind of like phase in my life, I started, I actually, even before then, actually, even before then, I had started going more into the gym and strength mm. training and like building up my body, right? So I realized right. that there's a lot of like, kind of like chronic, and like subtle injuries I kept having, you know, playing mm-hmm. soccer all the time, like it takes a beating on you, right? Mm-hmm. You know, playing six, eight, 10 hours a day, and you're playing on concrete, on grass. It's like, it takes a beating. And I found that even at a young age, you know, 17, 18, 19, I was kind of getting some of these like niggling, like injuries, right? And I was like, mm-hmm. wow, you know, maybe, maybe there's a way to like strengthen up my body. Maybe there's a way to not just be like athletic, but also to be strong, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously, I'm not such a tall guy. I'm not a big guy. So I, I found like, all right, maybe I need to just get strong, get some muscle, right? So that's kind of like my initial motivation. Mm-hmm. But then as I progressed, especially with, with strength training, I found like it's not just such a, a physical activity as it is a character building activity. And I mm-hmm. found the more that you do it over years and years, the more you find like mental and um, emotional traits, like fortitude, resilience, determination, all these things are also developed simultaneously. So going back over to um, when we first started Vegan Fitness Redefined, 
Uh, my wife had actually been working as, or she has experience as a nutritional therapist, so very deep experience in nutrition therapy uh, and like holistic healing arts and things like that. And I came with all the experience as an athlete and, you know, being a fitness coach and things like that. And we thought, wow, you know, both, be, both being vegan at the time, we're like, wow, it would make sense to kind of like pair up our skills and talents and actually help right. people in these things that we're already passionate in. Hmm. I, had a, I interviewed a, another vegan couple. It's called Eat, uh, Eat Move, Rest, the Stancics, and they have a, the very similar picture. They each came with different talents and created something new. So that's pretty cool. So what do you offer at Vegan Fitness to Define? Like what, what do you do if you take someone who's in, just entering into this and they reach out to you for coaching or some advice? Like where does someone start? Right, right. So typically we have kind of like a little bit of, uh, an interview process, right? So when someone mm -hmm. first reaches out, we don't always take on every person. And I say this like, because a few years ago, we used to just take on everybody. We're like, oh, come, we'll be your coaches. Like, we'll serve you. And we found that, you know, going a little bit slower, especially in the beginning, makes a big difference because we're able to understand the, the student, the client much more deeply. We're able to understand their goals, their needs, mm -hmm. their aspirations. And when they do come in, if they're accepted, what we go through is a three-tier process, right? We go through mindset strategy and their accountability needs right and we found with all three of those areas it's essential because some people right they may think like oh you know i just need to focus on my macros or my calories or i just need to get you know like uh, you know muscle building workouts or fat loss workouts right but the reality is all all behavior is belief driven right all behavior is belief driven and so if we don't have the right mentalities right, the right belief system in place, most of us end up self-sabotaging three, six, 12 months down the line. If we don't have the right accountability to hold us on track, when things get, you know, rough, right? <laughs> you know what I mean by that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you go off and you're on vacation or you get sick or, you know, something happens with the family, right? If we don't have these three systems in place, it's an inevitable, right? Even if you have the best plan in the world, if you have the best workouts, you have the best nutrition, I mean, the chances are, and even looking at the statistics, 95% of people who lose weight end up regaining it in five years or less. This is nuts, right? The fitness industry, the health industry, we're failing people, right? If we don't understand these behavioral change strategies. Hmm. So how do people change their mindset or how do you judge someone's mindset to make sure that they're actually in a place to be ready to take on transformation? Hmm. It's a great, good question. So psychologists have found that it takes up to 69 times for us to hear something before it starts to sink in. And while some people, they may never be truly ready, there's an emotional investment that needs to be there in order to move forward, right? You need to be, doesn't mean you have to be like, oh my God, my mindset's perfect. This is the right, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about, are you serious and emotionally invested? Even if you get thrown off track, even if you get sick, right? as long as you're emotionally invested, right, in your health, in your fitness, right, it's very, very likely. I mean, it's not 100%, but it's like 99.9% .9 chance that we will succeed. And when we understand that even if your mentality, your mindset isn't perfect, the more we can repeat the right patterns, the right beliefs, things like progress or perfection, one day at a time, setting up winning streaks, right? Focusing on what's going well, not mm -hmm. all the 50 things that, you know, were shitty that week, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really the key there, taking into account some of these psychological principles, but also repeating it, you know, just putting in the reps for our mindset, for our, for our mind, right? Mm -hmm. Just like we do for our body, for our muscles, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean by repeating? What are you repeating? What's, is this a mantra, a words, a belief? Like, what does that mean exactly? You know, it can be it can be a few things. It could be an affirmation, right? We we believe in the power of positive affirmations. So that's one possible route. It could just be writing down, you know, three to five key mentalities, reviewing it on a daily basis. You know, maybe there doesn't need to be an actual like verbal articulation of it, but actually reviewing it. You know, the reality is most of us we don't create our current beliefs overnight. <laughs> as as much as we like to think like that, we didn't wake up and think like, oh, I'm gonna. I just suck or I'm not good at this or, you know, I'm not right. destined to be healthy and fit. We didn't create that overnight. So we have to acknowledge creating new neural pathways, right? In our brain, in our prefrontal cortex. It just takes time, right? It may not take you 20 years, may take you a few months, may take you a year or two, 
but creating those new neural pathways, which is essentially what's happening, just takes some time. Gotcha. And so then, so let's say they, someone's got the right mindset, mindset, they're emotionally invested, as you say, and now they move into fitness. So what does that look like? So how does someone begin a fitness journey? Let's say they're maybe a little bit active or, you know, they're not crippled or anything or unable to participate. How do you start someone where, what does that conversation look like? And what should someone be thinking about? Right. So we, we truly believe in the power of standards. Stand and while we while we have goals, and I think it's important for us to have goals, like whether it's drop 20 pounds or build 10 pounds of muscle or you know improve health or, or blood pressure, whatever the goal is, we believe that having a standard actually can be more powerful than just saying, here's my goal, right? Because mm-hmm. when most of us start a health and fitness journey, we have goals like every week, like, oh, this goal, this is my goal for the week. I'm gonna do this thing and I'm gonna do this thing. I'm gonna to go to the gym five times a week. I'm gonna walk 10 times, a week. whatever the goal is, right? But when we have standards, and to clarify what I mean by standard, a standard is your baseline, right? It's what you do not tolerate to go beneath, right? Hmm. So a standard could be minimum three strength workouts per week, right? Hmm. Not a goal, like, oh, this week I'm gonna work out three times. No, as a bare minimum, I'm going to get three strength workouts. If I do four or five, awesome. That's bonus. But as a bare minimum, I'm going to do three strength workouts. Another standard would be five nutrition tracking dates, right? As a bare minimum, right? Mm -hmm. Not that every meal has to be perfect. Not every meal has to be like this beautiful Instagram friendly. Like this is my whole food plant-based meal. Look, everybody. No, Mm it doesn't have to be like that, right? But at least five days that you're tracking your nutrition and working towards, you know, healthy, nutritious meals. You know, the rea- we, really, we really believe that if you focus on the things that give you the most leverage, right, at least 70 or 80% of the time, it doesn't, need to, it doesn't mean you have to be perfect, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean you have to be always like on point, always have to be like Instagram photo shoot ready, right? Mm-hmm. As long as you're doing things 70, 80% of the time, Mm-hmm. This is going to give you massive results. And, and as opposed to trying to be perfect, like 100% of the time. Gotcha. So you're, instead of trying to reach a goal, you're, you've kind of flipped it in the mindset of mind thinking, this is literally the bare minimum that you, you will accept, right? So this, mm-hmm. this otherwise, yeah, I kind of like that because you're thinking instead of always striving, striving, striving to meet something and you don't meet it, then you feel, ugh. But it's other difference thinking is, hmm, the, I don't accept anything less than the minimum that we still know will be the 80%, the Pareto rule type thing. Gotcha. That's exactly. good. That's really good. I haven't had anyone say that before. Um, and I mean, I've had <laughs> over 300 interviews at this point. And so, um, yeah, that's very good. That's good thinking. So now, now we've got that is there any specifics that you find that are helpful like in those three you know strength training exercises per week and in those meals that you're tracking how do you define those for the individual because they're all obviously Mm. going to be a a bit different yeah yeah so there's some like main overarching principles and i can touch on that in a second yeah but yes you're absolutely correct like on an individual to individual case by case it, it will vary but as an overarching principle, when it comes to strength training, what we look at is really using the law of progressive overload, right? Mm-hmm. Making sure that over time, we're lifting heavier, we're adding more volume, whether that's sets, that's reps, that's poundage, right? We're using, basically, we're using the principles of physics to ensure that, okay, we're not just going in the gym and we're doing five hours of cardio and then we're like, why am I not sculpted? Like, why don't I actually look fit, right? And again, it's nothing against cardiovascular health right? Card- cardiovascular training is actually phenomenal, right? This is a great way to uh, improve health and, you know, and, uh, plenty of other ways. But when it comes to strength training, this is hands down one of the most effective ways to lean out, to tone up and actually build up our bone density, our muscle mass, improve our connective tissue, et cetera, et cetera. So number one is the law of progressive overload. And then number two is making sure that we have a way to track this. Right. And I think it's very easy, especially when you go to the gym, you're like, oh, and I just did all this workout. I did these weights and it's all great. But the reality is when we can be objective, right, when we can actually have the data measured together, we can actually see week by week. 
holy crap, I'm getting stronger. Oh my God, I'm putting in more reps. I'm lifting more weights, right? And I think that's something that it, it makes it very powerful when you focus on your behaviors rather than just getting caught up in the results, right? Being more behavior focused, like, oh, you know, let me focus on lifting more. Let me focus on uh, putting more sets and reps as opposed to like, oh, every week I got to drop two pounds or every week I got to build a pound of muscle. You see, we get so obsessed with the results and you'll notice it takes the joy out of the process, right? The joy of just enjoying it. Like, oh my God, just going to the gym. It can be a joyful activity. Just cooking a meal. It can be fun, right? But when we're just focused, like, oh, I got to have this perfect meal or this meal better help me drop two pounds this week, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of takes the joy out of it. Mm -hmm. So you're just, in, it's the process of just seeing that continual improvement, not necessarily this very distinct outcome, like the weight loss or whatever that may be for someone interesting. Okay. So that's good too. I mean, it really makes you think about how we speak to ourselves, right? When we're doing something and it really just the conversation inside the head it, where it's easier to get off rails, but if you're looking at it a different way, it really is a change in how your perception is um, as you're Absolutely. participating in the activity. Got it. Okay. And so now we have the mindset, we are working on, you know, minimum standards threshold. Like I just don't do this. Right. It's kind of like saying someone's saying I'm trying to quit smoking. And someone says, I'm not a smoker anymore. Right. So the, I'm not yeah. a smoker. It's not going to go back to smoking. There's someone who's like, I'm trying is trying to meet that goal is trying mm -hmm. to so it's the belief system that you're describing 100 percent believe that um <clears throat> so now we have those now what with the food is there any particular principles regarding the nutrition that um are kind of generalized principles that people can take into account if they're thinking about this <laughs> yeah definitely so we we try to see nutrition from a holistic perspective because especially in the fitness industry uh and myself included you know it's very easy to become dogmatic right mm -hmm. to fall under these nutrition doctrines and laws and like all oh, oh, you know these you know, this nutrition dogma also has like priests now you know it's like oh this is a nutrition guru now right mm -hmm. so you try <laughs> you know i'm being facetious right now but it's it's very easy especially especially in the in the health world right, right. I, I really believe that with food and like food beliefs it's like you can go down a lot a lot of rabbit holes mm -hmm. so instead of just focusing on one aspect we focus on three different angles of nutrition I'll cover each one in a second. So the first part, and I think this is actually the most important, you can say this is the base of the nutrition pyramid, is how are you eating, right? How do you eat food, right? Are you somebody that just like eats food in five seconds, right? You don't actually process, you don't actually digest the food, right? 30 to 40% of the digestion process actually happens when we chew the food, right? So we want to be clear, how, how are you eating, right? Mm -hmm. Before we start looking at quantity or quality, right? And there's been studies specifically done on how people eat. There's actually one great study where they had two groups of people go in to a movie theater and they gave them popcorn, right? It's like one group, of, one group got a big, big, big bucket of popcorn. The other one got maybe like half the size of it. Mind you, the popcorn they gave them was stale. It wasn't, it wasn't good popcorn. It was just stale popcorn, right? And so these people, they went in to watch the movie. They had the popcorn, right? Researchers are watching. And they found that both groups of people finished their buckets of popcorn all the way to the bottom, right? Mm. All the way to the bottom. So what does that tell us, right? What does that tell us? Well, it teaches us that people, when they have food, more often than not, they eat what's in front of them, right? They eat what's in front. No matter, doesn't matter the taste, doesn't matter the situation. We typically finish all of our food. It's how many of us are conditioned. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's really understanding, first and foremost, how are we eating? Are we eating mindlessly? Are we eating mindfully? How, are we eating with maybe being mindful of our portions? Right? How are we eating? And then moving over to quality of food. Right? And quality food is one side of the pyramid as well. And quality food, this is, um, this is one that we're very passionate about, especially in the past couple of years, seeing the impact of having all the vitamins, the minerals, the antioxidants, the phytochemicals, right? All these essential, like seriously, essential, essential ingredients that all of us need. And yet so many of us are walking around completely deprived, depleted, right? And it's so sad because that's essentially, that is the source of so much of our suffering, all of these chronic diseases and symptoms and conditions, right? 
So it's really focusing on, do we have a base of what we, what we call the, the holy four foods? Do we have enough fruits, vegetables, whole foods, and herbs and spices, right? It, it, it is being mindful, right? It is being mindful. Our soil, it is depleted, right? Mm -hmm. we, we have to be aware of that. Our soil is actually depleted. So it's being aware of that, possibly being open to maybe, you know, a little bit more organic produce, right? Because of all the pesticides and all the toxic and everything they're putting on there. But if, if all you can get is conventional produce, that is still a win. I guarantee you having three apples a day will beat having three donuts a day. Doesn't matter. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So those are the three principles. And then do you look at someone, let's say that um, they're trying to lose weight, where do you begin to assess their caloric needs, uh, macro needs? Because I will get these questions. If I don't ask, I will get comments. So please share that, that kind of strategy and how yeah, you begin. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So that's, that's actually the third one. So that would be okay. quantity, right? So we covered mm -hmm. how do, how do, how do we eat? What is the quality of what we're eating? And then how much are we eating? And so when we look at how much, this is the law of energy balance. This basically dictates, right? Energy in energy out. It's a little bit simplistic. There's obviously more nuance to it, but mm -hmm. essentially using this model, we can start to calculate, okay, let's say Lori comes in and she wants to drop, you know, maybe she wants to drop 10 pounds, right? And so we have to set up, all right, so what is Lori's maintenance calories, right? What is her calories that will basically maintain her current body weight and current body composition? Once we have that, and we'll go through a calculation just setting up, you know, some of your biometrics like age, height, weight, activity levels, um, NEAT, which is non-exercise activity level, basically like what you do when you scratch your head, right? So non-exercise activity thermogenesis, and then the thermic effect of food. Once we have that, again, so a little bit scientific, so I don't want to overwhelm everybody who's listening. They're like, holy shit, what did you just say? No, keep it simple. We just put that into a calculator. It calculates it for us on the individual. And then ideally, we look at dropping anywhere from 250 calories up to 500 calories a day in order to ideally aim for the gold standard of about one pound of fat tissue per week. Again, that can be variable. Some people, they'll notice like, oh my God. And actually, let me go back a second. As a preface, as human beings, we tend to overestimate how much we really burn and we tend to underestimate how much we really eat. So mm -hmm. keeping this in mind, right? It's the reason why most people say like, hey, listen, Gabriel, like I hear you on this, but like I dropped 500 calories. Okay, it's actually possible that, that that's the case, but it's also quite possible that maybe we aren't tracking correctly. Maybe we are under tracking. Maybe actually your body has already adapted to those new calories, which is very, very feasible, especially if you've been in, um, in a dieting phase or in a caloric deficit for months or even longer than that. So it's keeping all those variables in mind. Again, it doesn't need to be complicated, but kind of keeping that in mind, that's the initial calculation. And then from there, I always say that's just the first one, right? Because usually then we may need to make an adjustment, right? And usually mm -hmm. typically after that, you make an adjustment every couple months after that. Does that make sense? <laughs> I know I went a yep. bit of a tangent. <laughs> yep. And then, so that's the caloric um, amount. And the, now, how do you divide that up with the macros? Because I will get that question as well. So what is cool. your preference on percentages of protein, carbs, and fats? It, it, you know, again, I'll, I'll give a more uh, specialized answer, but it does depend on the goal. Mm -hmm. If you're working towards fat loss, uh, it can be one way and i'll explain that way and if it's for muscle building it can be a different way and if it's just for maintenance if you're just maintaining and you're doing more of like a body recomposition maybe sports performance that can be also a particular way i'll speak towards uh weight loss or fat loss first and then i'll go over to muscle building and then maintenance so for for fat loss for and i'll speak to the vegan and the plant-based community because that's primarily who we're talking to here but for the plant-based community it can be helpful to have protein a little bit higher during fat loss phases. And the reason why, and I know some people may have different beliefs on this, but the mm -hmm. reason why is because when we're dropping fat tissue, right, we need two things in place in order to retain muscle tone. The first thing we need is a signal from strength training to give us a reason to even keep the muscle, right? Mm -hmm. We don't get that signal, then the body will be primed to drop muscle tissue and fat tissue. Mm -hmm. Number two, we need 
we need at least a decent amount of amino acids or protein to ensure we even keep the muscles. So we can be working out all day, but if we don't have the building blocks, which is essentially what amino acids are, then again, no reason to keep it. So that could look like, let's say we have an individual, they come in and they want to focus on, let's say drop 20 pounds and for a macro split. So the first thing, setting the caloric intake. So when we, once we have the caloric intake, the macros gets very easy, right? Because then all we do is just set it up from there. So typically we look at protein, carbohydrates, and then fats as the last one. So we'll calculate protein depending on their body weight. Mm -hmm. And I know some people may be listening and they track in kilograms, So depending on their body weight in pounds, right? So in pounds, we look at typically at a range anywhere from 0 0.8 grams up to even 1.5 grams of protein per pound. Again, depends on the person, right? Mm -hmm. There's kind of like a general range, but anywhere there, we'll calculate first the protein, making sure we're ensuring muscle retention, right? While we're dropping weight or dropping fat tissue. Mm -hmm. Then we're gonna prioritize carbohydrates. And again, this one is, this one is demonized in so many circles, like carbs are the devil or carbs are bad and like all these different myths, right? But mm -hmm. primarily when we're getting carbohydrates from healthy, whole foods, plant-based sources that fuel us, mm -hmm. we also have to understand that from a fitness or a performance aspect, carbohydrates are actually muscle building. They actually mm -hmm. aid in the muscle building process. Whereas some of us may think like, oh my God, it's not good for muscle. No, actually carbohydrates are actually very, very essential to muscle building because our muscles are 80% water, right? So 80% water. And when we keep in mind that for every one gram of carbohydrate, you're storing three grams of water, right? So many people, when they drop weight, they're like, oh my God, I dropped 15 pounds in the first month, right? It's like, okay, that's awesome. Let's acknowledge that. But probably 12 or 13 of those pounds was water weight, <laughs> mm. right? So we want to acknowledge that it's, it's very easy, right? It's very easy to get kind of like fooled by the scale on the weight. But when we understand, okay, carbohydrates, yes, it's probably going to retain a little bit more water, but wait, okay, I actually need carbohydrates to build muscle, to keep my strength as I'm focusing on dropping fat tissue. And then the last one then will be fats. And then we'll typically look at anywhere between like 20 to maybe 30% for fats. We don't, we don't keep, we don't typically keep fats as high. We just want to keep it there for more for hormonal bone, uh, hormonal balance and not overloading the, the body with fats. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with fats, but the higher the fat intake, the more likely our liver is going to have to work harder to process the extra fat and break it down. Mm. Okay. So that was weight loss. What about what in that changes for the muscle building component? So this guy, it's actually a lot. I would say actually, if you're working towards like a fat loss phase or you're like how we say in the fitness world, you're shredding or you're, you're dropping fat. I would say it's actually a little bit more challenging because you're going to have less calories coming in, which means you have to be more strategic with protein, carbs, and fat. With muscle building, you don't have to be as strategic. And what I mean by this is that when you're muscle building, you can actually get most of your protein intake from whole food plant-based sources. Whereas maybe if you're in a fat loss phase, you might need to be a little bit more open-minded to maybe a little bit of protein powder, maybe, you know, a little like you know, vegan, like processed uh, protein, you know, that, that may be the case for fat loss, but muscle building, like we've actually found because so much of whole food plant-based sources, when you mix them up, right, whether it's like from uh, a grains or a legume or even vegetables, right, it's mm -hmm. actually really, really easy to hit protein goals and carbohydrate goals and fat goals while doing it kind of like in a fun and more sustainable way, if that makes sense. So typically for protein, we're looking at about like 0 0.8 to about 1.0 grams per pound for muscle building. So a little bit less. And then for carbohydrates, again, this is where we can have a lot of fun because muscle building, depending on how long you're doing it, you get a lot more room for like, you know, playing around with macros and eating a lot more. Um, so carbohydrates can any, go anywhere from like 40 to even like 70% uh, of the intake coming from carbohydrates. And then whatever's remaining, we a lot for the fat macros at that point. Gotcha. Okay. And so, um, so we had the mindset, we talked about the food, we talked about the macros, what's left in the journey of transformation for someone. So once we have these things left and I, we covered a lot, we're like, Oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> what's left essentially consistency, 
consistency mm -hmm. and accountability. And there may be adjustments, right? Because again, this is just the first, you could say like initial adjustment. We first said like, all right, these are first targets for the workout, first targets for nutrition. The main thing here is now collecting data, whether that's from a nutrition tracking software or a strength tracking software, and then making sure we have data there so we can observe it like objectively, right? And then continue to refine the process. This may take anywhere from like two to six weeks as we're refining things, as we're like, all right, so how much, how much weight do I need to live in the gym? Well, usually that takes a couple of weeks until you start to adjust and start to like recognize, okay, all right, maybe, maybe I don't need to be lifting the five pound pink dumbbells anymore. Maybe I should go over to the 20 <laughs> now, <laughs> right? Starting gotcha. to understand, okay, what are the, maybe for nutrition, what are maybe six to eight meals, right? Mm -hmm. That I can consistently have maybe templating out as a recipe or having it as um, kind of like saved as storage, right? Kind of getting all those kinks out in that first month or two. And then from there, essentially, it's just being consistent. I know there's a lot of sexy stuff in health and fitness, but essentially with the principles that we're covering right here with the law of energy balance, with looking at the law of progressive overload and looking at whole food plant-based foods, essentially, I guarantee you would see better progress than most people who change their strategy every month or every year, every single decade. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So that really lays out a very simple map of, I mean, I say simple in the sense of, you know, <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are strategies and principles in place that you've seen will work when people are consistent with their actions and habits, which that's the hard part, right? That gets back to the mindset and the behavior component, which is, by far the most difficult aspect of any of us who are trying to help people find better health. Um, fantastic. So this was fantastic. Is there any other final advice you'd like to share with anyone who is considering starting this journey? Because you're obviously very knowledgeable and what have you seen helps a lot of people? Mm. I think the most important thing is having an open mind. Mm -hmm. I think that's been one of the most powerful things I've had I've experienced in my own life is mm -hmm. having an open mind, being receptive, being a student at heart. And I think it's very helpful when you have an open mind, even, you know, even if you're not vegan, even if you're not fully plant-based, or even if you are, right, maybe you've been vegan for 10 years or 20 years, right? The thing is, when we have an open mind, it actually, it's like, I love the analogy of a garden, right? When we have a fertile garden, right? When the garden's ready to be planted, or when the student is ready, when the teacher appears, right? We're able to grow much more exponentially. And, you know, they've done plenty of studies on the, the difference between a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. But, you know, you'll find that in society, the people who tend to grow the most, learn the most, you know, maybe even enjoy life the most are the people who have open minds, the ones who are like, okay, maybe, you know, doing this other random diet thing that I found on the internet, maybe I, maybe I, I should be open to something. Maybe, me doing, you know, 20 hours of cardio on the step master. Maybe, you know, maybe I should look at something else, right? You know, mm -hmm. the whole point here is just being receptive to learning because even though, it, even if we end high school or college or whatever educational place you've come from, you know, the thing is the learning never ends, right? It's mm -hmm. always there. And, you know, the information now is so readily available that I think it's actually not a lack of mis, um, not information. It's actually a, um, too much information. It's like what, what happens when people get too much information, they get um, like info beasts, they get obese with information. So it's absorbing what's useful, discarding what's not, and then adding what is uniquely mine. Like, what is it that resonates with me? What is it that makes sense? What is based on evidence-based principles? And then moving forward with that. Mm -hmm. No, I think it just relates back down to searching for the truth, right? And what's working, the hard facts of, at least in our scientific realm that we have evidence of, and always being curious, right? It's a, mm -hmm. it's a superpower. Curiosity, um, you just look at little kids, they're always curious. They ask tons of questions. And so yeah. when you go into it, like with the, the curiosity mindset and the joy of learning, that makes the whole judgment of, am I being open-minded? It doesn't even matter because you're just always looking for curiosity and looking for answers you're open-minded, right? So, and yeah. just minding your response though, because sometimes we live in our silos and then someone cracks open a door and is like, hey, what are you guys doing in here? What about this? And people get a little defensive, but just being, I think like an open heart too is really key just to, yeah. to oh, be accepting, that. accepting of 
whatever news is coming your way. So absolutely. Okay. That's fantastic. Okay. So, yeah. well, thank you, Gabriel. Is there, um, if there's any place we should be looking to find you besides uh, veganfitnessredefined.com, uh, where else can people be in touch? Sure, sure. So you can find me on Instagram at Gabriel underscore Chenye. Uh, and if that's hard to spell, I'm sure Lori will. There will be a link, but it's Z-H-A-N-A-Y. Yes. All right, all right. And then uh, also on Facebook, you can find me and add me at Gabriel Chenye. Gotcha. Perfect. Yes. We'll have links to all those guys in the show notes, um, but definitely share this with someone if you feel that might resonate with and leave a, a great comment, subscribe. And we're super excited that you came to speak to us today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lori. It was a pleasure being on with you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. And I hope you enjoyed that video. Before you go though, please hit the subscribe and alert buttons so you don't miss out on any of the amazing content we're working so hard to provide you. We upload a new episode of Health and Mora with Dr. Lori Marbus every Friday. Now, if you'd rather listen to the podcast, you can find us on all the major platforms such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, and even Spotify. If you're looking for amazing resources to help you start and sustain a plant-based diet, exercise, recipes, or anything wellness, we got you covered there too. Because at Mora, we actually provide physician-led support groups to help people live happier, healthier lives free of metabolic disease. Don't forget to check out our website at mora.com. And thanks again for watching.